So thank you all for joining to the, this latest in our novel justice series at the Wilson Center for Science and Justice at Duke, where we're bringing in authors who are writing compelling work about our, our criminal system. And we couldn't be more, more honored and pleased and excited to introduce you all to, to Tony Messenger here to talk about his new book, Profit and Punishment. Um, Messenger has won any number of awards, including the, the Pulitzer Prize for reporting going back quite a few years now, documenting the abuses of criminal debt, uh, particularly in Missouri, but obviously this is a national, national problem. Uh, Messenger lives in Missouri and uh, is the Metro columnist for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. And for those of you who've heard of Ferguson, you know that, that Missouri has been ground zero for, including because of Tony's coverage, uh, for interest in the abuses of, of the criminal debt system. Uh, this is not a, a, a problem that is going away quickly. I think I saw that you were reporting just today on how um, in the civil suits, people still haven't been compensated for abuses coming out of Ferguson. Yeah. Um, but uh, our plan is for, for Tony to, to, to say some words for like 15 or 20 minutes to kind of give you a tour, an introduction to profit and punishment. I can't recommend it more strongly. It's, it's such a compelling, disturbing book. Even if you feel like you've, you've read about Ferguson, you know that, uh, that uh, policing for profit is a problem. Um, your eyes will still be open much wider than they already are, even if you feel like you've, you've, you've been exposed to, to, to this. Um, and certainly if, if you haven't been all that exposed to the, to the problem of policing for profit, then, then you really will, will be blown away. Um, and please just even if you think of a question, um, you know, anytime that, that Tony is talking, you know, post in the chat or raise your Zoom hand or both and I'll keep an eye on things. And we really want most of this to be interactive and for you all to be able to chime in and ask questions and, and we can have some back and forth. Uh, so thank you, welcome, welcome remotely to Duke. We'd love to have you here in person before too long. And thanks for sharing your book with us. Thanks, Brandon, I appreciate it. It's good to be here. Uh, uh, I, I, I'd love to be out in North Carolina. I lived in Charlotte, North Carolina for a, for a brief period of time and, and, and love that state. So hopefully uh, we'll, we'll get that done sometime in the next uh, year or two pandemic uh, allowing it. Um, you know, as a, as a journalist, I think most of us who, who, who choose this field, we have this moment where we dream about what our life might be like if we could someday win the Pulitzer, you know, that top prize that, that everybody knows about that sort of identifies the best of, of, of journalism in America. And we have this, this image of flying all over the country and giving speeches and maybe writing a book and all of those things. And some of those things have happened to me, but the irony of my talks about both my Pulitzer Prize winning reporting and what went into profit and punishment is that it starts with a mistake. Um, there was no magical journalism jujitsu that, that you know, opened the doors to me discovering a problem that nobody else knew about, nobody else has written about. Um, what really drove my reporting into the modern day debtors prisons was a mistake. So let me just tell you about that mistake because it's key to how I wrote the book. It's key to all of these columns that I wrote. When I started in 2017 and 2018, uh, writing about this problem that uh, at the time I thought was a Missouri problem, it turns out it's a national problem, that poor people are charged money for fines and fees and the biggest one of those is often a charge for jail time. I had no idea that people got charged for uh, their time in jail. And that bill is often a massive several thousand dollar bill. And that people in Missouri were being put back in jail because they couldn't afford to pay that bill. And judges were finding them uh, in contempt after calling them back to their courtrooms month after month to explain, hey, you owe money for this bill and they'd miss a court date or they'd not have the money and they'd end up back in jail. And I started reporting on this problem and I found it to just be devastating. I was shocked by it. And a lot of attorneys in St. Louis that I was talking to were shocked by it. 
And so I asked uh, people that I knew in the legal community, particularly defense attorneys, I said, get me some of the worst cases. Because I saw this as a math problem. I thought that the way to explain this to people in a way that they would really understand it is, is, is a math problem. And they sent me some of the worst cases. And the one that I decided to focus on early was a woman named Brooke Bergen, who happens to be one of the three main characters in my book. Brooke stole an $8 tube of mascara from a Walmart in rural Missouri in Dent County. It's a place in the middle part of the state. And she ended up doing a year in jail for stealing that $8 tube of mascara, but that wasn't the worst part of it. She then got a $15,000 bill for that time in jail. And when she couldn't afford to pay that bill, she was threatened with more jail time month after month when she had to go back to the court, appear before the judge, pay 50 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever she could in order to pay down that debt. And a defense attorney sent me all the court documents from Brooks' case. I looked them up online to verify they were there, found a phone number for her, tried to call her, wasn't able to connect with her. But I wrote a story about her situation and other people like her in Missouri that were being put back in jail because they got these massive bills for their previous jail time. And I thought it was a math story. $8 tube of mascara, $15,000 bill. It seems unjust. And in fact, readers responded to it in that way. They were shocked by it. And it really helped drive my reporting uh, going on in, in, in 2018 and 2019 and continuing today about this problem. The day after that column ran, I got a Facebook message from Brooke Bergen. This is my mistake. Any of you who have studied journalism know that journalists today always go to social media to try to find people. We used to always find people in different ways through driver's license records and phone numbers and city directories that, that had reverse you know, phone number, address, all this stuff. Now we find people on social media. I didn't search Facebook for Brooke Bergen. I didn't search Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat or any of the uh, you know, various social media forms that exist that I know about. I didn't search for Brooke that hard because I had the court documents and I thought this was a simple math story. So Brooke Bergen sends me this Facebook message the next day and I'm horrified because here's this poor woman whose life I've written about now uh, uh, who, who didn't know her name was going to be in the paper, and now she's in the paper, and she sends me this note, and she says, hey, Tony, I saw that you wrote about me. She lives in Dent County. I'm in St. Louis, a couple hours away. She says, I wish I would have known about it, but you got it right, and it's interesting that you care about us because nobody down here cares about this problem. There's all sorts of people like me that are in jail consistently in Dent County simply because we can't afford to pay these, these bills they keep giving us, the fines and the fees and the jail bill. I'm glad you know about it. I'd love to tell you about my life. And this is when I realized that this debtor's prison story, if I was going to make a difference, wasn't a math story. It's not even a criminal justice story. It's a story about poverty in America and how our government systems, particularly our criminal legal system, are being used to exacerbate people's poverty. And to explain that in a way that people really understand, I needed to explain people's poverty. And I needed to explain that white people in rural Missouri were being affected by this problem, that black people in North St. Louis County uh, as, as, as lots of people learned going back to 2014 in Ferguson, we're being affected by this problem, that indeed, this is a national problem. We have a criminal justice system that is set up to extract wealth primarily from poor people. And it's incredibly inefficient, and it doesn't actually raise the money that they're looking to raise. In combination with legislatures and city councils and county commissions and sheriffs, and, and, and private for-profit companies, we take our criminal justice system and we turn it into a wealth distraction advice. And poor people suffer severe life consequences because of it, not because they're committing further crimes, 
but because they don't have enough money to write a check to get out of the situation that the courts are putting them in. So I went to Dent County and I met with Brooke and Brooke introduced me to some of her friends, other people like her, many of them single moms who had been in the Dent County jail, who had committed misdemeanors, often related to drug addiction, not always, but sometimes. And they told me about their lives and they explained how this system where they had to keep going back to court month after month after month in order to pay a pittance down on their jail bill that was never gonna really get paid down. I started to realize if I write about these people and, and their lives and how this debt is carrying with them for a year, for five years, for 10 years and affecting their lives even though they haven't committed other crimes, that's the story. That's how people are going to understand the criminalization of poverty in America. One of the people I met during this process uh, was a young man in Caldwell County in Northwest Missouri. I write about him in the book. He's a, he's, he's a minor character, but he's one that, that after I wrote about Brooke, when I was starting to write these columns, really resonated with people because they understood how silly this was. When he was 17, he stole a, a lawnmower from a neighbor. Was, was walking by, teenage teenage prank, walking by with, with some other teenage friends. Oh, look, there's a lawnmower out in the field uh, by this house. Let's go grab it. Took it to his house. The woman uh, notices that the lawnmower is gone, calls the police. The police check it out. They check with the, the teenagers. One of them points to this kid and he's like, yep, yep, I stole the lawnmower. So he gets charged with a misdemeanor when he's 17 years old for stealing a lawnmower. Ended up going to jail. Ended up being stuck in jail because they put bail on him and he couldn't afford the bail. He was a 17-year-old kid. Ends up pleading guilty, gets a bill for his jail time, can't afford it. I write about him 10 years later. His bill had gone from several hundred dollars to several thousand dollars because this is how the system abuses people. When he missed a court date, because he couldn't afford to pay his bill or because he had a minimum wage job that he couldn't get off work, there would be a warrant out for his arrest. He'd get picked up on a traffic ticket or something else. All of a sudden he's back in jail. The judge punishes him for another 10 days or 20 days by keeping him in jail because he missed his court date or because there had been a warrant. More costs are added, including for his time in jail. He gets out of jail and he gets this bill and his $1,000 bill is now a $2,000 bill is now a $3,000 bill. And he was unable to escape from this situation. And that's the story of Brooke Bergen. That's the story of Kendi Kilman in Oklahoma, one of, the, one of the main characters in my book. It's the story of Sasha Darby in, in Columbia, South Carolina. All over the country, people are arrested for minor offenses they then end up owing massive fines and fees that have nothing to do with their offense, but are put there by legislatures as backdoor taxes, primarily in states that don't want to raise uh, revenue in other ways. And they have discovered that it's easy to put a $3 fee or a $4 fee or a $1 fee or a $20 fee on top of, of, of various court services. And it's poor people who end up in the courts who can't afford to pay these and judges aren't waiving the fines and fees. Instead, they're requiring people to come back to court and if they can't afford to pay, they're going back to jail. I believe this is a debtor's prison system. The lawyers and advocates in nonprofit world who are trying to fix this system believe it is as well. Some of the judges deny it. They hate the, the idea that they're putting people in jail for their poor, because they're poor. They argue, well, I'm putting them in jail because they missed, a, they missed a court date. And what was the purpose of the court date, sir? Well, the purpose of the court date was so that I could collect money from them. The underlying context of people going to jail in America in municipal and county courts all over the country is often because they're poor. That's the story of profit and punishment. I'm, I'm hoping that the book has an impact on a national movement to uh, try to reduce this concept of the criminalization of poverty. 
Um, let's go ahead, uh, Brandon, and jump into you know questions and a discussion. There's so many different aspects of this. I'd love to you know take this discussion whichever way you'd all like to go. Uh, love to hear what what you all think. Um, so many questions. So, folks, raise raise your hands if you'd like to get on the queue or post questions in chat. Oh, one question I had was just. Um, you know, I know I know it, you struggled in connecting the stories you tell so powerfully to then find out, well, okay, like, is there data? Like, what do we know about like the, the number of dollars of court debt people owe in Missouri or in any other state or even for an individual person? Like, okay, so what's my total debt? Like if I could pay it, how much would I need? Um, maybe you could speak to just how, how poorly the court system even keeps track of of these debts that people are yoked to. Yeah, part of the problem is that what I'm writing about primarily is municipal and county courts. And, and there is not a national database of how much people owe. Some uh, various nonprofits at the Brennan Center and, and, and the Fines and Fees Justice Center uh, have, have estimated that there may be as much as $50 billion out there in, in uncollected fine and fees debt in the court system. Um, but even within individual states, there's not necessarily a, you know, one place where uh, the, the courts are keeping track. Um, and so trying to figure out how massive this problem is, uh, is difficult. And one of the other things that makes it difficult is in a lot of states, Oklahoma is one of these, and there's a civil rights lawsuit filed uh, in Oklahoma about this. In Oklahoma, a lot of the counties end up selling their debt to private for-profit collection companies. And those companies then add to the debt. They add all sorts of fees onto it. And even though they're private companies, they're still being used by the courts to threaten people with more jail time if they don't pay this debt. And so when you're selling this debt to private companies, then all of a sudden keeping the record, you know, keeping the records becomes even more difficult. So part of the problem with this idea of the criminalization of poverty in America is that there is not one easy database to track it in terms of how bad it is, but it's a problem in every single state. The other problem, and I get into this, is that the, the, the criminalization of poverty in our criminal legal system isn't just about the fines and fees. It's not just about bills for uh, court. It's about the improper use of cash bail, because that often starts the clock on people who are poor being stuck in jail pre-trial as compared to somebody like me who might be able to write a check if I'm charged with a minor offense or a traffic offense and never spend a night in jail. It starts with cash bail. Then you add the underfunded public defender system on top of it. Now you have somebody who's stuck in jail because they can't afford their cash bail. They can't meet with their public defender because the public defender system is uh, underfunded and the, their public defender is overworked. By the time they meet with their public defender, particularly if they're in a rural area, they might not be able to get a court date for another week to get before a judge to ask for a reduction in bond so that they can get out while they're pretrial. And by that time, the prosecutor often comes to them and says, you know what, you don't need to be in jail anymore why don't you just plead guilty? Uh, we'll get the judge to, to sentence you to time served, no more time in jail. They'll say that it's a year sentence, but we'll suspend that. And, and you'll get out and you can go home to your kids and you can go back to your job and all of that. Well, what poor person isn't gonna take that deal? People take that deal in municipal uh, uh, courts and, and county courts all over the country. And they take that deal because they want to get out of jail and they want to take care of their families and get back to their jobs if they still have them and all of that. What they don't realize often when they take that deal, besides the fact that it's a bad deal, they may have been able to beat the charge with a decent lawyer and everything else, is that they then get this bill for fines and fees and often their, their, jail, their jail time as well, and they can't afford to pay that. And not only can they not afford to pay that, the court is going to use their inability to pay that to threaten them with even more jail time. So people accept these deals without understanding the full consequence of what's going on 
uh, in their lives when they get these these massive bills that are heaped upon them by the system. That was a long-winded answer to your question, but. Brandon, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, I know a, a number of us here who I recognize on, on the Zoom and, uh, have been working in the policy space, trying to think of, well, what can you do as lawmakers to, uh, to reform these practices? Love to hear your thoughts on that in generally. And maybe one question specifically is, uh, if there are still some fines and fees that are sometimes imposed, how do you actually diligently look into whether someone could actually afford it or whether it's just gonna be a punitive debt that they can't pay and that will create terrible consequences for them? Well, let's talk generally about the, you know, the potential legislative fixes. And I, and I write about several of these in, in, in my book. So one of the simplest ones that is gaining steam, that is the most uh, successful across the country. There are now uh, a couple of dozen states that have rescinded old laws on the books. Unfortunately, Missouri is not one of them. I don't think North Carolina is one of them yet. Um, in most states, you can suspend a driver's license because somebody is behind in paying their court debt. And so what happens all over, the, all over the country, and let's start with just traffic offenses. You get a traffic offense, but you happen to be in a jurisdiction that adds all sorts of fines and fees onto it. So you get a simple speeding ticket or a, you know, not making a left turn or something like that. And all of a sudden you owe 300 or $400 and you can't afford to pay that you end up getting your driver's license suspended because of those costs that have nothing to do with whether or not you're going to reoffend, but are just about raising money for the local jurisdiction or for the state or for, for, for whomever. And think about that consequence. You lose your driver's license. Now you can't legally drive to your job to earn money to pay back this court debt. It doesn't make any sense. It's a solution that doesn't actually fix the problem. So lots of states are starting to change their laws so that the driver's license does not get automatically suspended uh, if you uh, don't have an ability to pay fines and fees. So that's a start. Um, there's some other progress happening in some different jurisdictions that the House in uh, the state legislature in New Mexico just yesterday uh, passed a bill that would allow judges to waive fines and fees in any sort of misdemeanor cases. So that's progress. Uh, I would argue in many jurisdictions, the judges already have that, uh, that ability, uh, particularly if they hold the constitutionally required ability to pay hearings and they determine that somebody's on, uh, qualifies for a public defender, therefore they probably can't afford the, to pay the fines and fees, they ought to just be waiving them anyway. In New York, the state of New York, the legislature, uh, a state senator named Julia Salazar has proposed a bill called the End Predatory Fines and Fees Act that would just get rid of all fines and fees. Frankly, to me, that's, that's one of my favorite solutions because it gets rid of this idea of using the criminal justice system as a backdoor taxing tool uh, on primarily uh, impoverished Americans. And so I love that solution. It'll be very interesting to see whether or not that bill, uh, you know, makes any progress. There is some progress in some other states, Nevada, for instance, in getting rid of uh, juvenile fees. Uh, there are fines and fees in the juvenile system that end up uh, costing parents a lot of money as well. And, and, and so there are, there, there's progress being made. There's, there's, uh, a couple of things happened here in Missouri and in Idaho that are interesting. So in Missouri in 2019 and in Idaho last year, their state Supreme Courts unanimously ruled in very similar cases that you can't put poor people back in jail because they can't afford to pay either their fines and fees or in Missouri, Missouri's case was uh, specifically tailored just towards the board bill, the bill that you might get for, for jail time. So in Missouri, unfortunately, there's a, there's a bifurcation between the board bill and other fines and fees. But in Idaho, a very conservative state, a unanimous Supreme Court said it is unconstitutional to put poor people back in jail because they can't afford to pay their fines and fees. 
Those are both really good rulings. Uh, and, and I'd like to think we'll start making progress around the country as various uh, uh, legal advocates and nonprofits and elsewhere uh, file more of these cases and try to get them before state Supreme Courts and ultimately the US Supreme Court to ultimately beat back this idea that we should be putting poor people in jail because they can't afford to pay their fines and fees. I'd love to see them all just get, you know, get rid of them. But, um, you know, there is incremental progress being made, at least as it relates to uh, not suspending driver's licenses and some state legislatures starting to realize that the fines and fees are getting out of control. I'm not sure if I answered the question entirely there, Brandon. No, that was great. Um, so there's a great question from uh, Kevin. Do you want, do you want, to, want to, rather than paraphrase, I'll let you ask it yourself. Oh, um, there were two questions that came before mine. I don't want to jump ahead of Melissa and Ben. Or should I just jump ahead? I needed to scroll up. Uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. We can then do, do, do you, then Melissa, then, then Ben. Sure. So hi, Tony. Thank you for your talk, um, for all the Thank work you. that you've done in Missouri. So I've been interested in the topic in the state of Texas. Um, and Texas, like Missouri, is a very regressive tax state. Um, policymakers there can never even mention the idea of raising property taxes. And so they've become extremely reliant on court fines and fees to fund all sorts of things. Um, and a lot of those things have nothing to do with the criminal legal system. And so in Texas, I've found that a lot of the groups that advocate for keeping court costs in place or even increasing the amounts that people get fined um, are usually groups that are not criminal justice related, like education groups, transportation, medicine. Um, I was curious in Missouri, from the time you started doing this work, who were some of the key interest groups that have been pushing back against reform efforts over there and how have they been doing it? Well, sadly, there hasn't been a whole lot of reform efforts in Missouri other than uh, the one specific reform that the legislature following the Supreme Court's lead passed a law that said you can't put people back in jail because they can't afford to pay their, their, their jail board bill. Uh, but, but, but there's been no real effort in Missouri uh, to get rid of fines and fees, except for in one specific case. And I write about about this in my book, and there's been progress since the book has been published. So there's a $3 fee in Missouri that pays for uh, sheriff's retirements. And it's one of those fees that, that, that like Texas, like lots of other states, has been on the books for a long time. Uh, back in the 80s, the, the retired sheriffs came to the state legislature and said, hey, we need more money for our retirement because our, particularly in the rural areas, uh, they're not paying sheriffs very much money, and so they're, they're kind of broke when they're retired, so we need some more money to help pay for their retirement. Can you guys help? And the legislature said, well, gosh, we're not going to say no to sheriffs, but we're not going to give you general revenue either, because Missouri, like Texas, uh, is, is a very uh, anti-tax state. They're not going to raise taxes even to pay for sheriff's retirement. Uh, and so instead, they added this $3 fee on every court case in Missouri. Now, one of the things that's significant to understand about Missouri is the massive bulk of the court cases are in Kansas City and St. Louis. And so poor black people, primarily because that's the folks that are going through the courts in that system in Kansas City and St. Louis statistically, are paying for the retirement of rural white sheriffs in other parts of the state. It, it's just not very just. And it's also, it turns out, unconstitutional. So for years, there have been a group of attorneys and judges that have been fighting back against this one $3 fee. And finally, last year, they got a case before the Missouri Supreme Court. The Missouri Supreme Court ruled that that $3 fee is unconstitutional. It is a sale of justice. We, it, that's a phrase I'm sure some of you have studied going all the way back to the Magna Carta. It's a barrier to poor people to have access to the courts if you're going to have to charge them this extra fee uh, on, on, on traffic tickets, on misdemeanor cases, on criminal cases that has nothing to do with the dispensation of justice within their particular jurisdiction. So the legislature, so the, the Supreme Court got rid of that $3 fee. It no longer exists. 
on, on the court cases. Well, that means the sheriff's uh, uh, retirement fund, their, their, their windfall just went away. So what happens this year? The sheriffs are back before the legislature trying to find a, another way to get a backdoor tax. So that's the challenge in beating back this idea of you're correct, the fines and fees that are being put on uh, people in the court system often have absolutely nothing to do with the, the you know, other concepts of, of, of criminal justice reform. I mean, some of it's for good, for good things. There are fees for uh, domestic violence services. There are fees for brain trauma. There are fees for all sorts of things that sound good but that theoretically ought to be uh, something that lawmakers debate in their regular funding uh, debates and their regular budget process, uh, you know, balancing things in terms of general revenue. One of the things that I argue in terms of gaining progress on getting rid of these fines and fees, and this idea has some, uh, uh, some relevance in Texas because the the, the folks on the, on the right side of the political spectrum in Texas, there's an organization called Right, right on Crime uh, that they've had some success in sort of pushing criminal justice reform ideas in Texas um, because there really is some bipartisan support for uh, both uh, on the left and the right as it relates to getting rid of, of, of fines and fees. And so, one of the things that, that I argue is, look, the problem is you don't have to look at it as a, if this fee goes away, we have to go raise some money somewhere else that taxes automatically have to go up. Well, there's another solution. There's a conservative solution. Stop putting so many people in jail. I mean, that's part of the problem. Putting people in jail is expensive. The mass incarceration problem that we have in this country is expensive. And if it was actually working and making us uh, safer, we'd be the safest country in the world. Um, but that's not the case. And so there's a conservative argument to say, you know what, we need to stop spending so much money in criminal justice. Uh, we need to stop putting so many people in jail, particularly people that are being held pre-trial um, that, that have not yet been convicted of anything. And then if they do get convicted, they end up owing all these fines and fees. So uh, I'd, I'd like to think that there is a, a conservative argument in places like Texas to get rid of these fines and fees, but you raise a good point. There, the, the challenge is there are all sorts of constituencies that are making backdoor tax, taxes off of the court system, and every one of them is going to fight back when the legislature gets smart, hopefully, and says, you know what, we got to get rid of these fines and fees. Uh, real quick to, to, to just put a, a, a bow on that. Uh, there is a bill in Congress uh, sponsored by uh, Senator Brian Schatz from Hawaii and uh, Representative uh, Jerry Nodler from, uh, from New York that would create uh, federal financial incentives for states that get rid of predatory fines and fees. So if a state does what New York is talking about doing in terms of just getting rid of those fines and fees, there is a bill in, 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 the, in Congress that if it were to get some, some steam would create a pool of money to help these states transition from, okay, next year you were gonna get a million dollars in fines and fees from, from all of these things. These things are going away. Here's a pile of federal money to help you ease you know, your way into a new system. Um, I think that's, a step in the right direction to help states ease themselves off of these fines and fees because they've been collecting them for a very long time. And so when they go away, you're going to have pushback from cities, you're going to have pushback from counties, you're going to have pushback from special interest groups that don't care about the, the criminalization of poverty, they care about their cash. Great, maybe we could turn to Melissa next. And uh, Melissa was asking about, well, what, what can community members, community organizers do to, to elevate these issues? Well, I mean, I, I think within your local area, um, find that organization that, that cares about these issues and help them out. So the ACLU has been very involved in some states 
in in uh, filing some of the lawsuits that are helping to elevate this issue. Uh, there's a, a nonprofit law firm in uh, St. Louis called Arch City Defenders that's been very active. Um, there are professors at Duke, at Georgetown, at lots of different places, law professors that are helping these nonprofit actors like Civil Rights Corp out of uh, Washington, D.C., file some of these lawsuits that are trying to get these issues uh, in front of the courts. And the challenge is ultimately getting them uh, all the way to a state Supreme Court or a, or a U.S. Supreme Court. And, and, and the interesting thing is when you actually get to the proper court, the success rate right now is, is, is pretty incredible. You look at the cases, the Wright and Ritchie cases in Missouri, the, the Roxana Beck case in, in, uh, in Idaho, you look at, uh, it, it's, it's somewhat related, but not really, the Timms versus Indiana case that, that was uh, uh, ruled on by the US Supreme Court in, I believe it was 2019, Ruth Bader Ginsburg actually wrote the opinion. That was a unanimous opinion, think about that. A unanimous US Supreme Court opinion said that the Eighth Amendment uh, protection against excessive fines applies to states. It had never officially applied to states before. That was a unanimous federal decision, and it's still relatively recent. And so I think that the various advocacy groups that are working in this realm need help. There's, there's an organization in Alabama that I, that I mentioned briefly in a column this week uh, uh, called, I believe it's called Alabama uh, Appleseed, or, or uh, it's one of the Appleseed organizations that's doing some work in this, in this realm. You've got the Fines and Fees Justice Center nationally that is opening up some chapters in some of the states. They're doing important work in this realm. Uh, the MacArthur Justice Center uh, uh, is doing some, some work in this area. So there's lots of different advocacy groups that understand this issue, that are trying to advocate uh, for the rights of poor people that are having their civil rights trampled upon by the courts, whether it be in the area of bail reform, whether it be in the area of uh, uh, private for-profit probation companies that are abusing folks, whether it be in the area of particularly fines and fees or driver's license suspensions, all of these things are related because they all contribute to the criminalization of poverty. Um, the, the, the biggest thing I would suggest within your realm is try to help one of those organizations, whether it's through funding, whether it's through legal help, uh, whether it's through letting your local newspaper uh, know about this issue. Um, there's been some really good localized news coverage and I, I relied on a lot of it in my book uh, when some of these egregious cases come up and people realize, oh my gosh, that's just awful. That should not be happening. Um, but you know, one story in one localized newspaper then needs magnified in another newspaper. I mean, I, we all watched, I was obviously here local when it was happening, but we all watched uh, on, on, on cable TV when, when Ferguson was happening in 2014. And obviously a lot of that had to do with the issue of police brutality and the death of Michael Brown. But the underlying issue that was feeding a lot of the protests and a lot of the angst specifically in Ferguson and the other North uh, St. Louis County municipalities in the St. Louis region, is that they were using their municipal courts and their police departments as a fundraising tool. And the victims were poor black people and they were ending up in jail regularly. And so their opportunities for uh, potential police brutality were significantly increased because of racial profiling and because of how those municipalities were using their police and their court systems. And that was seven, eight years ago. To, you know, uh, the, the, the lawsuit that, that I wrote about this week was, was, uh, was filed seven years ago. And the folks are gonna win their lawsuit. They're going to be compensated millions of dollars for uh, the, you know, the overall class of folks that were abused by these unconstitutional systems because they were being put in jail without ability to pay hearings, et cetera. But it's been seven years and they haven't been compensated yet. There hasn't been accountability yet. 
Um, and so anything that you can do to help bring this story to the attention of, of the national media through your local media, through the, you know, the local nonprofit organizations and legal organizations that are working on this, I think it really helps. And I think people get it. I think when you find the right explanation of, of, of how we're using our courts to trample people's civil rights after they've already served their time, that's really the key. All of the people in my book are people that um, in most cases admitted their crimes, served their time, paid their, paid their debt to society, but then the courts came down with them with this extra debt that had nothing to do with their crimes and, and, and tried to punish them over and over again because they couldn't afford to pay that debt. And they were never gonna be able to afford to pay that debt. When you explain to somebody that a woman went to jail for a year for stealing an $8 tube of mascara and then still owed $15,000 and, and was being threatened with jail over and over again because she couldn't afford to pay that debt, people, people tend to understand that story. So I have a great question from uh, Benjamin Rossi, uh, who's in a loud environment, so I'll ask it. Uh, he's asking about, like, is there a sense that this is a problem that's grown worse in recent years? Does it depend? I know in North Carolina, we trace a lot of the kind of um, increased focus in legislation, um, more sort of like oversight of judges and emphasis on collecting fines and fees to kind of, you know, the last 10 years. Uh, or is this something that's cyclical and localities just need to find money somewhere or states need to balance budgets? What's your sense of like the, the whether this is a growing problem or an ongoing problem? How, how should we think about that? Well, it's both. I mean, in some cases, there are some of you might have read about uh, a reporter named John Archibald, who won uh, the Pulitzer Prize in commentary in 2018. Uh, just wrote a series of stories about a town in Alabama called Brookside. It's near Birmingham uh, that, that he sort of refers to as the new Ferguson. And it's a little town that, that raises half of its revenue on traffic tickets. And, and it's really minor stuff. It's not like it's, it's a big speeding zone. They're pulling people over because they got an air freshener hanging because they don't have a light over their, over their uh, license plate in the back. I mean, it's, it's a fundraising tool. And so some, sometimes you have anecdotal situations where you've got a local town in which a mayor or a police chief or somebody sees a way to, to, to make a quick buck and, and does something and it works in terms of, of producing revenue. And so it just becomes a problem that feeds on itself. But specifically in North Carolina is a good example. Uh, I trace the, the, the exacerbation of this problem back to the last recession in, in approximately 2008. Uh, and since that time, I'm gonna get the, the, the date and the percentage a little bit off, but it's in my book. Uh, uh, and it's accurate there. Um, North Carolina fines and fees have gone up about 400% since the last Great Recession. So what happened was, and I'll use Missouri as a good example. So Missouri is one of those states in which every Republican, and we're a supermajority Republican state, every Republican has signed on to Grover Norquist's No New Taxes. There, there, there will never, ever, ever be a tax increase in, in the state of Missouri ever. And on top of that, we've got a constitutional uh, amendment called the Hancock Amendment, similar to the Tabor Amendment in uh, Colorado. Uh, also, there's a similar sort of amendment in Oklahoma. Lots of states now have these constitutional amendments that have passed in the past decade or two uh, that limit the growth of revenue or the growth of taxes in some capacity. Some, some limit revenue, some limit spending, uh, but when you have something like that in your state constitution, it limits the legislature's ability to raise taxes even if they wanted to. Um, so the, the, the Hancock Amendment has been in place in Missouri since before 2008. When the recession hit, our state revenue just tanked. Most states, state revenue after the last great recession just absolutely tanked. Um, and they were, you know, the federal government ended up eventually stepping in and helping much similar to how they're doing now during the pandemic. 
but a lot of states didn't recover very quickly from the last recession in terms of their state revenue. And so at the same time, states were being tough on crime. Remember, this was back, this was back during the three strikes are out days and everything else. And so state corrections budgets were going up and up and up because they were putting so many people in jail somewhat related to drugs, related to, you know, just overall tough on crime mentality. And in the meanwhile, state revenues were going down, down, down. So what did they do? They turned to the courts and they said, well, let's, let's try to raise some money that way. And that way a state lawmaker with a straight face can say, I didn't raise taxes. Now they've cut, they've cut college tuition or uh, college funding. So college tuition goes up and that's a tax increase. They've, they've added all of these fines and fees onto the court system, and that's a tax increase. And who pays for that? Poor people pay, because 80% of the people who come into the municipal and county courts end up being poor people. That's statistically uh, the number that are qualifying for public defenders across the country. And so that's, I trace in my book a lot of it back to the last Great Recession. The problem existed before then. We've had, we've had predatory fines and fees in our system uh, uh, particularly affecting people of color in the South for a very, very long time. Uh, but since uh, uh, the last Great Recession, in most states, uh, the, the amount of fines and fees have skyrocketed. Great. So uh, nice question from Macon. Do you want to jump in and, and ask your question if you're in a sure. quiet enough spot? Yeah, sure. Hi, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. I just wanted to know if you could talk, if you ever, if your research ever looked into um, like the specific breakdown of jail fees, because in a lot of counties in North Carolina, um, when you, you know, I go around and I interview different people working within the various county jails and local municipalities and they have just crazy fees just associated with just being in jail. So like if someone needed medical attention, if you don't have it, it you have to, they take it straight from your commissary. And if you don't have it from your commissary, the minute you do get commissary, it retract retroactively comes out. And so I just was wondering if you ever look into the break. I, I know that data is probably even harder to get because it's all broke, like very small and county driven, but I just didn't know if you ever looked into any of that specifically. So I've done some research into that and I've written a little bit about that, but my book doesn't actually get into all of these additional costs that we that we put on, you know, what you're talking about is this whole prison industrial complex that exists out there. I mean, for instance, during the process of writing my book, uh, I've got an account with JPay. JPay is a is a private email service owned by a, 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 a wealthy private corporation uh, that contracts with state and county prisons uh, so that people like me can email with people who are, uh, who are in prison and, and in jail. And it costs money. Every time I wanna email somebody, I end up buying them extra stamps and sending them stamps so that they can email me back. Um, that is just one of the elements of the privatization of our system. Healthcare is probably the worst part of it. Uh, I don't get into that in my book, although ironically, um, uh, I'm working on a proposal for a second book in which that might be an aspect of what I get into, because it's just another place where we're helping private industry make money off of the backs of poor people uh, for no real purpose. And the most insidious part of that complex as it exists, as I see it right now, is that those private companies basically pay legalized kickbacks to the people that they contract with. So if you want to provide uh, uh, email and, and uh, some of the companies now provide tablet services where they provide, you know, say an iPad uh, to uh, the folks who are, who are in jail uh, to do, you know, various services, watch movies, play games, whatever. Um, they'll sign contracts with the county jail that says, uh, you know, if we make X amount of money, you get a 10% cut of that. Well, <laughs> you, uh, of course, the, you know, the sheriff's going to say, hey, free money for me. I, I don't have to pay for it. I don't have to go to my county commission and budget for this anymore. So I'll just have this private company pay for it. And who pays for it? The families of the folks who are stuck in jail, who we hope are going to get out of jail and reintegrate in, into our communities at some point 
But meanwhile, we've, we've made their poverty worse and we've made the poverty of their family worse. At the same time, also a private company can, can, can profit off of our mass incarceration problem in this country. So yes, I'm aware of that really huge problem. I don't get into that into, uh, in profit and punishment, uh, but it is something that I'm looking at writing about. Thank you. I was wondering if you could speak to, well, I, I feel like actually when I've spoken to uh, judges on law enforcement, one of the more resonant points has been that, um, that being placed in the position of being a debt collector harms the legitimacy of public servants, that people just can't view them as caring about justice or public safety if they have this other, if they're being placed by county government, state governments in this revenue collecting role. I don't know if, I mean, obviously if, if they really are embracing their role as no, we'd like to make money for ourselves, they're not gonna think that way. But um, I do wonder what it does to, to just the perceived legitimacy of our judges, of our, of, our, of our law enforcement officers, if people get that actually, they're there to make money. So I think it really damages the, the, the independence of our judiciary. And I write about that. There's a chapter in my book called Judges versus Judges. And I point out the dichotomy in Missouri and a lot of states are like this. Uh, we, we choose our judges and elect our judges in different ways all over the country. We're actually one of, one of only a couple of uh, first world you know, type, type countries that, that, that elect judges. Most countries other than the United States um, appoint their judges through a merit system, similar to how we, how we appoint some judges in Missouri based on what was originally called the Missouri plan developed here in, in Missouri, where we tried to get rid of the corruption of, of judicial elections. And we now uh, have a merit-based system to uh, appoint our Supreme Court judges, our appellate judges in the state of Missouri, and our circuit judges in, in St. Louis and Kansas City and Springfield. And lots of states now have various forms of, of the Missouri plan for at least some of their judges. But here in Missouri, as in many states, we elect some of our local judges and then we appoint some others through the merit system. So if you look at the cases that made their way to the Missouri Supreme Court, uh, the George Ritchie and the John Wright cases, where these were, these were people who started off in a circuit court and they had locally elected judges that were putting them in jail because they were poor. And these cases were all originally filed in that jurisdiction. The attorney uh, uh, who used to work for the public defender's uh, system named Matthew Mueller would file motions to retax costs in those circuit courts. And then the judge would refuse to do it, say, no, they've still got to pay those costs. And then he filed appeals in, in the appeals court and ultimately made it to the Supreme Court. So the Missouri Supreme Court rules unanimously and clearly with no equivocation that this is an illegal thing. This can't happen in the state of Missouri. You can't be putting poor people in jail because they can't afford to pay their, uh, their board bills. It's illegal. The law doesn't allow it. So how did the Missouri Supreme Court get to that decision unanimously? And the circuit court judges all over the country and or all over the state and some of the appeals court judges um, didn't see the law the same way. Well, because they're working in the little county courthouse on the square, and they're elected by the same people that elect the county sheriff who's putting the people in jail and has to run the jail, and the same people who elect the presiding commissioner who figures the budget. And the pressure from that sheriff, who is always going to run on a tough on crime, you know, sort of mentality, and the presiding commissioner who has to uh, fulfill the budget. The pressure from those guys on the local uh, judges uh, changes, I think, the way they look at the law. And I think it very much negatively affects the, uh, the independence of the judiciary. I think a lot of those judges would love to not be in that position um, and, and would love to feel like they could just go ahead and waive those fees or advocate for the legislature to, uh, to just get rid of them. But, but it, 
I, I believe it really just puts in focus how electing judges uh, is is not necessarily the best thing for the overall independence of the judi judiciary. When you have uh, the the dichotomy between the the Supreme Court ruling and all of those judges got into their position through the merit system, which isn't completely clear of politics, but at least they don't have the same local pressures uh, that, a, that a locally elected judge in, in a podunk rural county has. Um, it's not that those judges aren't smart. They all went to the same uh, uh, law schools. They all, you know, all the judges in Missouri, for the most part, went to the University of Missouri or Washington University Law School or St. Louis University Law School or UMKC. They, they all go to the same conferences. They'd all know each other. They read the same law books. None of those, none of those circuit judges think that the Supreme Court got it right, got it wrong. They, they, they can read the decision. It's a clear uh, unanimous decision, but they work in a courthouse in which the pressures are different. Why? Because they're elected. Um, and that, you know, that problem hasn't changed. And I think that's, uh, you know, part of the problem that we have in our judiciary, uh, you know, in, in, in different states. We, we have a variety of different ways in which we elect and appoint judges in this country. And as we see it right now with our own, the political, the politicization, I can never say that word, uh, of, of our U.S. Supreme Court, um, the independence of the judiciary is an important concept. And uh, it worries me that in, in many ways, locally and nationally, we've, uh, we're, we're at sort of a, a, a dangerous precipice in this country. I think that's a, a really wonderful way to, to focus on the one of the many precise legitimacy problems that it, it endangers judicial independence. Um, and uh, well, there's a lot more we could talk about. There's uh, we, we did much more directive uh, action in North Carolina where judges are basically told that they have to report to the legislature on any white waivers of fines and fees and, and detailed reporting. That if, wow. you, if you're, if you're going to waive fines and fees, like you need to report to the state house, and so <laughs> um, that was a quite clear message that we don't want any waiving fees. We we need that money, uh, but uh, um, and I you know we all wish it was maybe different when you had appointing judges, but you know we know that there's a lot of unpaid debt imposed in the federal system even, and there's messages from Congress saying, well, you need to collect more. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, this is, this I think is the federal a system, the judges I've talked to in the federal system seem to think that, that, that I think they do a better job of waiving fines and fees uh, uh, in the federal courts than, than at least I see in the, in, the, in the state and local courts. And there are some, there are, you know, there are some places that in, in, in which judges do a pretty good job of waiving those fines and fees. But I, I, I don't think it happens anywhere near as much as, as, as it does. And, and we ought to make it easier for judges by getting legislatures to not impose those fines and fees in the first place. Yeah, and I think, you know, your book and your work, I mean, certainly in the federal system, you don't have, you know, hundreds of thousands of infractions, misdemeanor cases, traffic right. cases, so many right. of the cases that those of us who can pay a $60 ticket and forget about it, you know, I've never been to traffic court in my life because I can just pay a ticket if I get one. Um, and so it's so important for those of us who never see the inside of these, these low level courts that just don't look like the courts we see on TV to realize what, what's happening with these kind of debt mills that, that can occur. And um, so uh, thank you so much. Um, oh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. We're, Grateful to those of you who could join us today and we'll wave virtually to those of you who, who watch this video a little bit later. We plan to host this on our website and we'd really love to get you to, uh, to Duke in the future because it's a pressing issue everywhere and, and we'd love to share your work with an uh, with in-person North Carolina audience uh, down the road. Well, I appreciate it. Let's stay in touch. Thanks, everybody. Take care, everyone.